Welcome in to another edition of Inside Carolina's Post Game. I'm Tommy Ashley. That's John Bowman. That's Justin Jackson. We're sponsored by Johnny T-Shirt and JohnnyT-Shirt.com and Congruity. Uh, this is sort of the shooting it straight post game. I'm just here um, so I don't get fined uh, joining in. So I'm going to kick it over to John Bowman. Carolina gets the win, 72-65. John, I entitled it Grind Out a Win. The photo of Baycott, I think, was probably the play of the game that sort of turned the game. I don't think Carolina uh, trailed after Baycott still and dunk. But take it away, my friend. I think that's a great place to start tonight because what a game – from Armando Baycott on both ends of the floor. I was so impressed with him. He looks like he's moving as well as I've ever honestly seen him move. He was finishing dunks uh, for those on the message boards and on Twitter who were concerned with the few missed dunks uh, that he's been having the last few games. And defensively, UNC asked so much of Armando Baycott and and Jalen Washington as well tonight. Uh, They asked them to stay in front of guards on switches, move their feet, Uh, protect the rim, get rebounds against a very physical pit team. And every single time that Armando was asked, he stepped up. So it was a really exciting game to watch, uh, a thrilling game. Uh, UNC advances to the championship of the ACC tournament. That game will be on Saturday, and we await to see the winner of Virginia and NC State to see who UNC will play in that game. Uh, That's at 8.30 on Saturday, I believe. Justin, I want to kick it to you as well. What's your first impressions uh, from tonight's win over Pitt? Um, I think uh, ACC tournament compared to ACC regular season is a little bit different of a vibe, isn't it? Um, You know, I think you see all of these teams. uh, I mean, you look at NC State, they have to win, what, five games in five days to win an ACC championship in the tournament. Obviously, North Carolina gets the double bye, so they have to win still three in three days. Um, but you just kind of – you saw, um, I thought, two desperate teams, which is crazy to say with North Carolina being the one seed in the tournament. But you really just saw two teams that were just doing whatever they possibly could to try to come out with a win. And, um, you know, for me, I think the biggest thing is Mondo. I know we've been on Mondo quite – quite a bit kind of throughout the year. I mean, he came into the season with kind of the most accolades and all the records that he's broken and all of the, you know, hype and things like that. And there early on in the season, it was kind of, you know, we didn't feel like he was the same Mondo that we've seen, you know, the couple of years prior. And I think tonight was kind of him returning back to form. Um, I mean, like we talked, like the, you know, the thumbnail kind of hits it right on the head defensively he was causing issues even guarding guards which obviously North Carolina has shown that they can play defense throughout this season but if they're able to basically switch one through five and there's no real drop off I think there's really no holes in this North Carolina defense so you know you see Mondo switching out obviously you see Jalen Washington switching out which I think is one of the points that I wanted to hit on um and we can talk about that but I think for me today was all about Mondo. Obviously, RJ down the stretch hit some big shots and, you know, hit some big free throws and things like that. But Mondo really set the tone early on, um, and I think the rest of the team just kind of followed. Muted, Tommy. Starting out good. Not <laughs> not used to being second chair, but for me to sort of hit on, uh, to sort of hit on what Justin said, Baycott came out with a purpose. I think – they interviewed him on the floor after the game and he sort of talked about that. But Justin, let me ask you how, you know, obviously you're not a big, but you're <laughs> eight or, you know, six, eight, six, nine, whatever on a given day. What is it like to have to be switched out on a small guard? I mean, obviously Baycott's gotten so much better at handling that, but it's hectic, right? Especially on a guy like Carrington, who's just going nuts. Um, I don't think folks understand how difficult a task that is that Baycott's really undertaken the last month of this season, have they? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, um, you know, for one, you got to give credit to Carrington. I mean, I didn't realize he was a freshman with the way that he was playing. Um, So for one, you're asking him to switch on to somebody who was really the, at the time, was really the only guy who really had it going for for Pittsburgh. So you're you're asking him to switch on to somebody who's already in a rhythm, already kind of has a flow to the game. 
And it's 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 something mentally whenever a team is trying to get you matched up on somebody to try to go at you. There's something if you have if if you know for fans who have never really played basketball, they wouldn't understand kind of the whole mental aspect of things whenever you're guarding somebody and they purposely call your man up to set a screen to get switched on to, you know, whoever it is that's got it going. So that's one kind of the mental aspect of things. But then physically for him to be however big he is, 6'10", whatever, and to be able to move his feet and cause, you know, we're not necessarily asking you to block every shot or, you know, for them not to score, but to cause everything to be difficult for the guards that have it going. Um, it's extremely difficult to ask a big to be able to do that, especially the whole entire game, and then to ask him to do everything that he does on a normal basis as far as rebounding, dominate down low. Um, so I think that's, uh, you know, like you say, it's it's not many people would really think that it it's really that big of a deal. A lot of people would say, oh, it's just a big switch now and he's playing defense. That's what he's supposed to be doing. But you look at some of these shifty guards and guys that he's having to stay in front of, it's actually really impressive. Yeah, when you look at that, you, you know, folks talk about how – Cadeau's able to take somebody to the rim when he gets switched on a big. They don't. They can't really do that against Baycott. And, and I'm going to totally get out of John's way here, but I do want to ask you one more question because I think this is maybe directly related to, to your game. Is Henson obviously got off to a slow start. <laughs> Harrison Ingram was all over him. But when you're a guy that has scored a lot of points, your primary focus of your team, Sort of talk about the mental side of it, because I felt like Henson sort of shot them out of the game a little bit. Um, sort of rushed some shots, just went YOLO a couple times in that second half. It was like, I've got to get mine. I've mm -hmm. got to get them. And he just wasn't on. Just sort of talk about the mindset of being a guy that can score that's really been shut down and being able to defer to other guys when the other guys are hot. Yeah, I mean, it's – um. You know, it's funny because going into the game, uh, I don't know who I was talking to, but, um, you know, they were talking about Pittsburgh as a tough matchup just because of how they play and how Henson is kind of that, you know, when it comes to scoring, he kind of is that matchup that you have to watch out for. Um, for me, I wasn't necessarily worried at all because we have Harrison, and that's just a tough matchup for a guy like Henson. It's another guy who is physical, um, kind of the same speed and athleticism and things like that. And he just causes everything to be difficult. And so, you know, going into the game, I didn't necessarily think Henson was going to go two for 12 and 0 for 5 from three. I think he had a few air balls, which kind of to your point, a lot of times you start to, if you are kind of the main score on your team, you start to kind of press. You feel like the next one has to fall to help the team. Um, but a lot of times when, when it's when it's a situation like this, now you have to kind of become the decoy or you have to become the screener in certain actions. You saw the way that, there were a few plays I know Jay Billis was talking about on, on the broadcast, but um, there were some plays where RJ was kind of that screener. He was kind of that decoy. And a lot of times whenever you're the screener as the main scorer, for one, they don't want to come off your body. So now your screens are even more potent because now you're basically setting a screen with two guys. Um, or if now all of a sudden the defense wants to start helping off of you, now you're the one that kind of has more space and things like that. And, I think that for me, kind of throughout the game, Pittsburgh's offense to me wasn't necessarily sustainable when it came to um, really getting guys open looks on a consistent basis. A lot of it um, ended up just being, okay, they were trying to get a different matchup. A lot of times it was Mondo or Jalen Washington switching out. Now you're just playing ISO ball for the last 15 seconds of the shot clock. Now to their credit, they had guys who were knocking down shots and things like that, but I just didn't think their offense was necessarily conducive to get Henson going when he was already struggling um, to kind of start the game. So, but to your kind of to your question, as a scorer, you have to be able to kind of look and say, okay, this is basketball. Some days I just don't have it going. Some some days they've got a great game plan, but now I have to use that game plan kind of against them. Now I have to use Harrison's aggressiveness to now I'm a screener. So now if he wants to be hugged up on me, whoever I'm screening for is going to be wide open. Um, or maybe you become a slasher or a cutter or offensive rebounder, whatever it might be. There's certain things 
throughout the game that you kind of have to be able to look inside yourself and say, okay, you know what? I just, I don't have it going today. You know, I'm not going to shoot a, I'm not going to shoot a three from five feet behind the line with two hands in my face and hope that it goes in. I'm going to try to get whatever I can for this team. So, you know, but once again, it's, you know, you got to give the credit to Harrison for making things as difficult as possible on him, you know, and there was other guys also that switched off onto him and made things difficult, but you could kind of tell he was definitely in his head and pressing a little bit, which is tough as a score. Some perspective as well on Hinson's performance tonight. His last four games, he had 19, 27, 21, and 20 points. Tonight, he finished with five. And Pitt, as a team, in their last four games, they had scored 90, 88, 81, and 81. Tonight, against UNC, they could only muster 65 points. I think that speaks to UNC's defensive abilities tonight. They were an excellent defensive team. Uh, we talked about Harrison. We talked about Armando, but throw Seth in there, throw Cormac in there, really up and down the roster. It was a great defensive performance. I want to flip it over and, and talk about the offensive side of the ball a little bit. Uh, Cadeau was sort of the story of game mm -hmm. one with his effort, his energy. He made some great plays tonight, but I thought it was interesting the decision that Hubert Davis made to kind of go away from Cadeau a little bit, especially in the second half. Um, I think the final number of minutes that Cadeau played yeah, in the second half was just seven, uh, whereas he played 14 minutes in the first half. Um, I noticed that Pitt was really sagging off of both Cadeau and Trimble in the first half and basically daring them to shoot the ball. Uh, some of the most aggressive sort of lax defense on those two guys on UNC's non-shooters that I've seen all season long. So Hubert Davis and UNC adjusted. Uh, Seth in the second half set more screens. So he kind of was you know, putting his defender in the action. So he wasn't able to be a help defender as much. And Cadeau kind of played his role in the second half, but also, uh, you know, didn't play as many minutes. Justin, what did you see from UNC offensively there with, with the two guards, with Cadeau uh, and with Seth and just more broadly UNC on offense? Um. I mean, I think tonight was the first game in a while that I've seen the opposing defense help off as strong as they did tonight. You know, we saw a lot of this, you know, year last year, year before, whenever a lot of times they did this same thing off of leaky in games. And um, it takes a lot for a player who is, you know, quote unquote, the, you know, the weaker link on offense. It takes a lot for them to kind of swallow their pride and start to do things that still help the offense. And I think the tough part is I think Seth kind of knows his role from that standpoint a little bit better than Elliot does at this point in time. Um, obviously, I mean, Elliot can pass the ball. He can get in the lane, make plays for other guys. But when he doesn't have the ball, how is he affecting the game when that, sort of defense is being played on him. And like you said, Seth knows he can go get the gets the offensive glass. He can cut. He can set screens for other guys. Um, one thing that I've kind of been a little bit more shocked with is that Seth has actually shot the ball really well throughout the season. Now it's not on a lot of shots, um, but there are times where he's not even necessarily looking to shoot or looking to be aggressive at times. Um and so for me, if you're going to have Seth in the game because the defense is being played that well, I'm living with him shooting three or four threes in a game if he's shooting 40-something percent from three. Um, and at the same time, you know he's going to do everything else that he's supposed to be doing. Defensively, he's going to sit down and guard whatever position he needs to guard. Offensively, he's going to get the offensive glass, cut, slash, um, do all of those little things. So I think if I had to guess, that was kind of the mindset between playing Seth in the second half as opposed to Elliott, just from kind of how they were playing defense, the different matchups that they had on the floor, and kind of just having that experience. At the end of the day, Elliott's, what, 20 years old, 19 years old, um, and he's never been at this kind of level. Um, and he's never had to figure out ways to win games at this, you know, level and at this speed, at this physicality, things like that. So – if I had to guess, it was kind of the experience piece that kind of made them go that route. Um, and at the end of the day, it's tournament time. So <laughs> feelings and 
minutes and things like that, it kind of goes out the window when it gets to this time of the year. So, um, you know, I thought it was a good move and I think it worked out for him. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up the rebounding as well because that was such an important part of tonight's game. This was a physical game. This was a battle. Every single possession, Elliot was not afraid to stick his nose in there and go up and try to get some rebounds. Uh, Cadeau finished with five rebounds, and then Seth finished with three rebounds as well. And um, just more broadly, just a great stat line from Seth Trimble tonight. 24 minutes, one of one from the field with the three-pointer, uh, two free throws. And then four assists as well for Seth, which is really impressive to kind of get some extra playmaking out of him on a night like tonight. I think, Tommy, another player we have to talk about a little bit more is, is R.J. Davis. It just feels like time and time again throughout the season when UNC needs someone to step up and hit shots or the game's slowing down a little bit, R.J. Davis delivers. What do you see out of him tonight? Uh, a couple things, John. One thing about Seth, too, and I'll back up just for a second, is – Seth can, I thought Carrington and Lowe cooking a little bit, you, you got to sort of put somebody on them and be able to switch off somebody on them. And I think that's a big thing about Seth being on deep, out there a long time too, is to have that extra length on them. And then also he could guard Henson. And, um, you know, Ingram played wonderful defense on Henson. Nobody's going to doubt, doubt that. But when Seth was switched off on him, he handled it too. And he also slowed Carrington and Lowe down. Um, and, and we've talked about Cadeau. If Cadeau is uh, – if he's got a weakness, his shot, yes. But the defense, he's got better on defense, but he's not Seth Trimble on defense. So I think that was a big thing. For RJ, RJ felt like in the first half he was deferring to try to make sure everybody was getting theirs early. And because he knows that you have to have everybody involved – um, in a game like this. That's Justin talked about the experience factor. Well, RJ has played a ton of basketball. And he can go for 42 on a night, and they barely beat Miami in the Smith Center. Well, he knows that he can go for 25 on a night like this in a, in a tournament game, and then they can ultimately beat Pittsburgh by seven um, because he allowed other people to get cooking a little bit. And I think RJ's – one thing, and it doesn't really show up in this box score, but and Justin, I want you to comment on this too as as well. If you have a if you have one, is RJ's ability or willingness to go get rebounds. You mentioned it about Cadeau. How many times have we seen RJ in the middle of everybody, smallest guy on the court, and he's small, folks. I, I mean, <laughs> if not heart, not grit, not toughness, but his stature. He is not a big fella, and if you go walk on a basketball court, these guys are big, and RJ will go in and get the rebound, Justin. That that right there, when you've got a guy like Ingram, when you've got Baycott, when you've got Trimble getting rebounds, Washington and Withers, but when you see your point guard or your little shooting guard go get rebounds, I mean, that jacks you up, right, as a guy. And then you can get out and run because he doesn't have to pass to anybody. Just sort of speak to RJ's ability to do that part of the game, Justin. Yeah, I mean, it's um, – I think that's what makes – I mean, for one, that's that's a, a reason why their defense is so um, so good night in and night out. There's really no – a lot of times, you know, you might play one good possession of defense, you play 30 seconds of good defense, force them to a tough shot, and then all of a sudden, you know, a guy comes flying in, offensive rebound, now you got to play another 30, 30 seconds, whatever it is. And uh, with this team – there's really no holes when it comes to rebounding within basically at all times, all five guys on the floor. And that's like you said, it's a testament to RJ being willing to get in there, mix it up a little bit with the bigs. I mean, if you really look at it as an ACC player of the year and averaging what, 21 points, um, you know, he, he almost has a right to at times take plays off. Right. Like he's almost earned the OK, you know what? I'm a little tired right now, so I'm going to go guard whoever it is in the corner and I'm just going to chill for a little bit. Right. They just kind of earned that. But to see him, like you say, still battling uh, to see him still. I mean, it was you know late in the second half and he was still getting up pressure in the ball, getting over screens, things like that. That's kind of a testament to what he is for this for this team. Right. Like like you said, he can go score 42. I mean, he's one of the best little guard scorers that I've really ever seen. Um, 
But at the same time, for him to be doing the things that he needs to be doing, as far as getting in there, mixing it up defensively, you know, trying his best. Like you said, at times, I think RJ's size does come into play defensively, um, which is something he can't necessarily do much about. But the things that he can control, he definitely controls. And, uh, you know, I think it's a perfect picture of kind of what this team needs to be at the head um, and to kind of keep this thing going. It's funny, when you look at the box score, nobody else scored above double digits outside of Mondo and RJ, right? And so when you have games like this where Cormac goes one for nine, Elliott's two for nine, um, you know, Harrison wasn't necessarily involved a ton offensively. Um, their little things matter. And so you see like a possession in the first half, I think, where RJ got a rebound or I think it was a rebound and pushed it all the way down, got a layup on the other end within five seconds, right? Like that's the biggest thing when it comes to RJ getting in there rebounding. Now you don't have a big that's looking for an outlet, slowing down the pace of the game. Um, now you've got the ball in your playmaker's hands coming full speed at, you know, at the defense that's also backpedaling and it causes issues. So kind of to your point, man, it's just doing all the little things and people, you know, fans, fans don't necessarily realize it, but when it comes down to tournament play, the possessions are so much more important. And I think that's one of the biggest changes within, even if it's a Duke regular season game or an NC state regular season game, these possessions seem so much more important because the teams are so much more desperate. Obviously, North Carolina, they're in the conversation of a one seed, two seed, whatever. I don't know what they're going to decide. But with a team like Pittsburgh, they're on the brink of not even making the tournament or you know, being the last four in or whatever. So the little things are what matters. And I think the little things are kind of what they were able to tighten up on as the game went, went on. And I think that's kind of what gave them the edge when this game ended and they were on top yeah a lot of people don't see the you see the flashy pass from Cado to rj for the layup but you might not see baycott slowing down just a little bit to keep his guy behind him and sort of setting a screen to free that layup up and then when you see baycott running or rj running on the other end i think the camera angle was through the backboard one time on the rj layup Pitt was panicking running back you could see it in their bigs face like oh that word i gotta get Mm -hmm. back and that puts stress on teams and folks don't get it i do want to talk about and folks drop your questions in the chat for justin but i do want to talk about withers and washington because trimble gets the most talk washington and withers i think are bigger keys for this team to a win tomorrow against either virginia or nc state and I'm sure every Carolina fan currently is pulling for NC State. I have no idea. Um, you know, if, if Carolina loses, everybody pulls for Virginia. If Carolina wins, everybody pulls for State. It's just the nature of the of the beast. But even deeper in the tournament, you've got to have somebody on the bench that comes up and makes plays. And Justin, Washington and Withers, I'm sure they'd love to play more. I'm sure they'd love to, you know. But they, they've not sulked. They've not um, had any negative – energy and they again tonight washington six points on three of three withers two points on two of two combined for six rebounds in 16 minutes they just constantly make themselves felt out there hubert talks about teams need to feel us on defense and all that kind of stuff washington and withers man I, i think i think they're bigger keys to this team than people want to think um your thoughts there because every time every national championship Every tournament title has always come down to somebody saying, do you remember what so-and-so did? Do you remember what <laughs> Melvin Scott did in 2005? You know what I mean? You remember mm-hmm. what whoever. And, and so just sort of speak to those two guys before we get into some questions for you. Yeah, I mean, it's – um, I was literally – I was talking to uh, – because I was watching the game and I was talking to actually Kenny uh, while we, we were both watching at the same time. And to your point – the you know i don't want to say professionalism because it's you know that's kind of a uh, weird word to use with college sports and the way the landscape is right now but they make a lot uh, of money though they they make (laughs) a lot of money um but the ability like you said for them to be locked in now i'm sure 
every basketball player wants to play 30 minutes, be the main one scoring, be the main one with, you know, getting all the highlights, things like that. That's every basketball player, every competitor. But for them to be able to still come in and contribute in the ways that they want to contribute. Um, I mean, I think what Jalen had like a fadeaway jumper uh, or yeah. Withers had like a fadeaway jumper. Jalen had, you know, a putback, a drop off layup, um, things that seem really small. But when you can have thing, when you can have guys come in and give Mondo a quick three, four minute break, and there's really no drop off at the time, or you have Withers come in and he's able to maybe give Harrison a break, and there's no drop off defensively, he can still guard Henson the same way he's been guarded all all game, um, and give those guys a rest, and also continue to you know make a run or things like that. That's just a plus, you know. It's it's kind of for me. When I think to to the year that we won it, you know, a lot of times, you know, everybody always put up the dunk that I had at the end of the game, right? Like that was always like the, oh, you know, kind of sealed the deal. But nobody really talks about Isaiah's unbelievable shot that he had on Jonathan Williams, where it was basically a double clutch one-handed floater over a 6'10 guy that really put us up, what, I think five at the time, that really kind of sealed the game. You know, nobody talks about that. And so when I see when I see kind of these two players in particular, that's kind of what I see in them. Like those are kind of some of the plays down the stretch that I think we'll see that people might not talk about, but it's a play at a particular time that is extremely important. Um, and for me, for Jalen Washington, you can't teach 6'10 versatility, pick and pop. You just can't teach that. Now, is he the most physical player and physically dominating player down low? No, he's not. That's just not his game. But when he comes into the game the majority of the time, whatever minutes he plays, you know Jalen Washington played because there was some sort of play that he made. There was a block. There was a rebound. There was a putback. Um, whatever it might be that you feel his presence. Like Coach Davis wants teams to feel. they want He wants to feel their presence. And you feel Jalen Washington's presence – and where there's presence the majority of the time that they get in. So I think those two guys, um, there's going to be a play down the stretch, whether it's tomorrow or going into the NCAA tournament, where they're going to make one of the most important plays of the game. And that's just kind of how things happen. And I think it's a testament to them staying ready and kind of being ready for whatever time they get. And a stat on the bench as well to close out this segment. The bench did not miss tonight. They went two of two from the free throw line. Seth made both his free throws. Seth hit a three-pointer. And then Jalen Washington, three of three on field goals. Jalen Withers, one of one on field goals. And, and Seth with his field goal. I mean, you can't ask for anything more. That's why Hubert Davis did all the things that he did in the offseason to bring in these sorts of guys to fortify the bench for moments like this. I want to take a quick second and give a shout out to our sponsors uh, shout out to Johnny T-Shirt. They sponsor this show, all of Inside Carolina's podcasts. If you need some UNC gear, you can check them out on Franklin Street or online. Also, I want to give a shout out to Congruity HR. You see their logo on the right side of your screen. Uh, shout out to them. And if you need any HR or payroll needs for your small or medium-sized business, be sure to check them out. We have 724 people here in the live chat, which is awesome. Thank you, everyone, for watching live. You guys have put in some great questions for Justin. Um, so Tommy and I are going to kind of go back and forth here and, and cue some questions up for Justin. Um, before we get into the serious questions, I just love this. We have to show this. Uh, this is from Hopeful Redback Spider. Uh, shout out uh, for meeting Justin at Smoothie King back in, in Tennessee. So shout out to Hopeful Redback Spider. Thank you for watching tonight. Uh, this one is from... Michelle, she asks, Justin, do you think this team has what it takes to be a contender for the national championship? And I'm going to pair that with this question as well from K.S. Durham. Justin, as a champion yourself, what do you see with this team that checks the boxes of a championship caliber team? Oh, man. Um, I think this team has everything that it needs to win a championship. Uh, with where college basketball is, where there's not really – Besides UConn, there's not really a, a team that is just head and shoulders above everybody else. 
I think this team has the experience. They've got defensively, they've got everything they need to cause issues for other teams. I think offensively, um, we've seen it. This game was a little bit different, but we've seen it, you know, probably the last five games or so. Consistency is kind of the key for this team. Um, so for me, they've got everything that they need. It's just a matter of, like we talked about before, are they going to be able to do the little things throughout the game to really win the games? Um, is Cormac going to be able to shoot as consistently as he shot, obviously, prior to this game, you know, the last five to ten games or however many games it's been? Is Harrison going to be able to offensively make an impact? Um, and can Mondo stay as aggressive as he is? And can Elliot, you know, continue to grow and mature as this, you know, tournament and things like that keep going on? But for me, I think there's they've got everything they need. Um, you know, they've got shooting, they've got scoring, they've got defense, um, they've got rebounding. And the biggest thing when it comes to tournament time is experience. I mean, they've obviously got <laughs> they've got some serious experience when it comes to age on this team. So uh, I like I like their odds. You know, obviously, I hope that they get the one seed. I think that makes things makes life a little bit easier, you know, as the tournament play goes. But I think they've got everything they need. I think one – Get the one seed in the West with Arizona year two. That, <laughs> that sets up a heck of a possibility there. Um, but a long way to go to get from for, to there, Justin. I wanted to ask you a couple questions. I'm going to throw um, this one up from George Jenkins, who's a regular on every Inside Carolina podcast. So shout out to George. Can you talk about how different it is playing one day rest versus the two to four days during the regular season? And then I'm going to pair that one with – from Timothy Phelps, who's another regular. How much does fatigue matter tomorrow, or is it all in your preparation? And I think for Carolina, um, obviously they'll play three days in a row. NC State, mm -hmm. if they get there, it's five days in a row. Uh, when you start – at this point in the season, everybody's tired, mm -hmm. and you're worn out, and you're dinged up, and you're, you're bruised. At what point does fatigue become an issue? for you as a player, for these players, um, where it where it physically starts to affect you? Because everybody's tired, but at what point does your game start going down because you're just worn out? I mean, it's uh, – I think even North Carolina, I think you'll see tomorrow, you'll see at times fatigue. There's going to be shots maybe that are short. RJ might shoot a shot that's maybe – usually he makes 75% of the time. Maybe he finishes it short or – Maybe Mondo isn't getting the same lift when it comes to rebounding and things like that. Fatigue is just a part of it, right? Like five games in five days, that's kind of insanity when it comes to college basketball. Like that's just physically, it's hard for somebody's body to hold up that long um, and still be able to produce at the same level. There's a reason whenever you watch like the NBA finals, why every time there's a travel when they have to go back to somebody else's home, it's usually a two or three day transition as opposed to, okay, one travel day and boom, you play the next day because for there to be the best basketball, there has to be rest. But obviously in college it's different, right? Guys are younger, which does play a part. Um, but at the same time, everybody's a human being. Everybody has aches and pains and, you know, maybe, Tonight, somebody might not sleep well or there's a test that you still have to study for that still kind of comes into play at times. Um, and it's just, you know, it's it's at at this point, it's more about just how badly do you want it? There's no like, oh, well, I sat in the cold tub after the game, so I should be good tomorrow. There's no I took three of leaves before the game. I should be fine. It's just a matter of, hey, do we really want to win an ACC championship or do we not? And uh you know, I think you will see tomorrow, if you really pay attention, you will definitely see fatigue play a part. You know, the transition might not – there might not be as much transition because guys aren't necessarily getting the rebound and pushing as fast as they did today um, and little things like that. But at the same time, if you really want it, you got to go out there and get it. So, uh, you know, I guess we'll see. And I think if North Carolina plays an NC State team who's playing a fifth game in five days, you know, I think you will see – kind of, you know, if I was going into that game, no matter how tired North Carolina is, you want to try to push the pace more. You want to try to use that fatigue a little bit more 
um, against them as much as possible. So, you know, I think this is kind of what makes tournament play fun to watch because it's just it's not two fresh teams going against each other. You got guys that are banged up, guys that are tired, uh, and you just got to kind of see the will of of each team going into it. I've got a fun one for you, Justin. This is from S Luke seven three one. Justin is playing in the G League. He played in the NBA this season. So this is for far in the future, but down the road, <laughs> there are a number of North Carolina Tar Heels who have now transitioned to the coaching ranks. I think I saw Jackie Manuel. I believe is an assistant coach now. A few others. Justin, would you ever consider coaching? Um, I think the key word there is consider. Uh... I think I would consider. I, I love um, I love helping people, and especially helping. I don't know if I would ever do NBA side of things because there's just a lot more that goes into that coaching. Um, but being for me, you know, kind of talking to Marcus, even and being on the the coaching staff, and just being able to help kids who are coming out of high school who are trying to make it kind of to this level where I'm at now and even further. Um, I think would be pretty dope. I think it would be really cool to, you know, day in, day out, you know, whether it's watching film or doing player development or whatever it is, helping a kid kind of transition from the high school realm through college and kind of see that maturity as, as the time goes on, I think is pretty cool to me. I think that would be a dope experience. Who knows? It might be sooner than, than you think with how this uh, NBA stuff works. Um, but I would for sure consider it. I think uh, I enjoy this though a little bit too much to kind of, um, you know, not experiment and see where I could take this kind of um, this realm of things, but coaching for sure could be, it could be in the, uh, the long-term plans. Who knows? I, I mean, look, a lot of people hate, Jim Beheim, but I think he's been great as an analyst. And uh, I don't know if y'all saw him the other night, and he may not be able to come back, but they showed a um, state guy doing the three goggles, and they asked Beheim what that is, and he said, I don't know why that team would be celebrating. <laughs> they hadn't done anything. <laughs> they, just, they, just beaten, they just beaten his team. Um, so I, I thought that was um, – yeah, I thought that was pretty interesting. And I don't really have a, a question for you, Justin, but I do want to thank you for, for doing this stuff. You mentioned it. it it's been an interesting ride to be able to see you and John do this show each week. I think I think fans, they like to hear from us. And when I say us, it's like regular people. Um, but to be able to hear it from a guy that's been in the fight and been in the arena – and uh, so I want to ask you this feeling. You mentioned the dunk against Gonzaga, and you're right. Everybody shows that dunk. Um, they show Kennedy's block, which was huge. Mm -hmm. They show the dunk. They show Joel flexing out, but they rarely talk about <laughs> Isaiah's. And, and Isaiah's shot, everybody talks about Marcus's in 16, and it was huge. But Isaiah's shot there in that situation where the way that game was going was just as big that they don't talk about a lot, at least from my perspective. But mm -hmm. let me ask you this. The ball gets – Kennedy blocks that shot. The ball gets knocked out to you, and it kind of gives me chill bumps thinking about it. But <laughs> what are you thinking at that moment when you realize, we did it, man. We did it. What was just sort of talk about that from your perspective because it was you that did it. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, first, it was uh, – people don't realize the amount of effort and preparation and everything that we went through from that prior year when we lost. Um, we lost in 2016 and obviously everybody knows how we lost and you lose guys like Marcus and Bryce. And I mean, obviously Marcus, he's, freaking in the rafters Bryce is up there he was an unbelievable that season he had was one of the best I've seen in the last 20 years um so you lose those guys and you don't just lose them on the court you lose them as leaders you lose them as you know guys that you look up to right like when I was coming into college 
Marcus the year before he was that's when he got named second half page because he was doing unbelievable things. So then you go into the off season or the the summer and you know not many people really knew but we were getting the locker room done all summer. So we were in uh I don't even know whose locker room would be considered but it was like a cracker jack box locker room. I mean it was Basically, it had like lockers, but it was a big U-shaped bench. It really wasn't even that big. Like when everybody was in the locker room, everybody was basically touching. We were all so close. Um, so we were dealing with that. So every time we did, you know, 7 a.m. lifts, we were in there before and after. Every time we did conditioning, we were in there. Um, and so, you know, you kind of go through that, which it sounds like a, you know, just kind of a bougie issue whenever you, you say it like that. Oh, we didn't have our nice locker room. But when you go through some of the 7 a.m. lifts and the conditioning that we have to go through, um, it's tough, right? Sometimes you just want to go in there. You just want to lay on the ground. Well, you, there's no space to do that, okay? So so you go through that. You go through, guys. I tested the waters. Um, I think Joel might have tested the waters or gotten some feedback or Kennedy, somebody else might have gotten some feedback. Um, and so now you're going through, okay, what does it look like as far as if I come back? Um, do I want to come back? My goal is to get to the NBA. So then once everybody got their mindset shifted onto, okay, we're coming back and we need redemption, we need to make it back. There was a lot of times throughout the season where it was like, can we do this? Right. Our first ACC game was against Georgia Tech at Georgia Tech, and we laid an egg and lost that one. Right. And so it's like you start off ACC play and it's like, can we get back there? And so then as the tournament goes on and you have games like Arkansas, where we probably should have lost that game. And then you have a game against, you know, obviously the Kentucky game where Luke hits the shot. And it's like mentally draining, physically draining. Now you got to come back and you got to play against Oregon, who was on fire. That, that team was probably playing the best basketball out of all the teams in the tournament at the time. And now you go against a team that's massive, that has three footers, that's got Nigel Williams Goss at point that's been playing un unreal. You've got other guards that are playing well. And so by the end of the game, that was the most tired I've ever been. Right. And I think going back to the fatigue aspect of things, I was 0 for 9 from three in that game. And some of them were just, I think it goes kind of how Henson was trying to press. I was pressing, but a lot of it was just fatigue, right? Leading all the way up to that. We've been going for what? That's five. I mean, going through the summertime, that's eight, nine months in a row of just working out, conditioning, practicing, games. Um, and I think I played all 40 minutes. Coach Williams made sure to get every bit of Justin Jackson because he probably knew I was leaving after that year. So um, so when I, when he blocked the shot and I got the ball, everybody gives me a hard time because they're like, bro, that was the most basic dunk. You could have like actually done something to actually be cool. But I was so tired that when I caught the ball, the only thing that I was making sure was that that ball went through the rim. That was the only thing. And at that time, I was so tired that if I would have laid it up, I was less confident about laying it up than just doing the basic dunk that I had. So as I got it, I tried to make sure I had my steps right. I tried to make sure the one dribble I took, that I didn't travel, that I didn't lose the ball. Um, but it was when I dunked it, it was a sense of um, obviously a sense of accomplishment but it was really like, I think redemption is the best word to describe how that season really was coming off of the, the year before. It just felt like everything that we set out to do, we accomplished. Like there was no, obviously we didn't win the ACC tournament, but for us it was, we want to get back to the final four and win the whole thing. And it's a sense of, and I'm sure everybody has experienced like something that you put in a ton of time and effort into and you finally accomplish it. And it's like, there's no better feeling in the world when you know you put everything into it and you've been rewarded for it by winning the whole thing. So like you said, like, I mean, this, this 
when you look at this team, this team is built to have that same kind of run. And I hope for them and their careers that they're able to, because that's some of the best times in the world that I had. It, it built some of the best relationships that I had. Um, and it really made, uh, you know, my three years there at school, it made it all, you know, it was just like a cherry on top. So, um, you know, hopefully these guys can create those same kind of memories and um, enjoy the time with each other. And I mean, it seems like they have plenty of fun, you know, even without having the the tournament run yet. So hopefully they can just build on that and kind of create the same memories that that team in 17 did. Yeah, I love that, Justin. Perhaps a preview of some of the same emotions that this team could feel upcoming in in, in short order in, in just a few days and, and weeks ahead. UNC beats Pittsburgh 72-65 to advance to the ACC Tournament Championship game. They have the opportunity to win the ACC Tournament for the first time since 2016. Uh, Justin, since a part of, of one of your teams. Uh, any closing thoughts, Justin, after this big win? Possibly UNC locks up a number one seed. They advance <laughs> the ACC Tournament Championship game. Justin, close us out. I don't. I personally don't see how North Carolina doesn't get a one seed. I mean, I think it would be a uh, travesty if a team like Tennessee, who just lost two games in a row, basically um, gets the one seed and we get a two seed. Um, but you know, we'll see what the selection committee um, decides to do. Like I talk about, man, I'm I I love kind of where this team is headed. I think consistency is still the key. Obviously, Cormac had 30 against Duke and had another good game, you know, yesterday. And, um, you know, it happens. The ball doesn't go in sometimes. But, you know, when you're one for nine, um, you know, playing 30-plus minutes at times, that can come back to kind of bite. So hopefully he can kind of stay rolling like he's been rolling and everybody else can stay consistent. I love kind of the maturity that we're seeing from Elliott and, you know, honestly, even the maturity that we're seeing from Mondo. Like Mondo is, it it takes a lot to be, to have all the hype and everything that you have going into the season. And then it's kind of taken away because RJ kind of becomes that number one guy. And now you're kind of on the back burner. So it takes a lot for you to kind of swallow your pride and say, okay, you know what? Then I'm just going to affect the game in the ways that I can affect it um, and help this team. So, you know, I'm excited. I mean, this is obviously as fans, these are the times that we love, right? And, um, they've set themselves up well. They've set themselves up to be able to make a, a really long run. So I'm excited. As fans, we have to uh, continue to support. I know people are still going to have their opinions. They're going to still have their uh, you know, thoughts and things that should be going on. But these guys, they hear and they see everything. Trust me, from a player's perspective, they see everything. And so uh, if you're really down for this team um, – Let's watch and let's continue to see them, you know, make some history and hopefully run and put up another banner. So I'm excited for it and uh, let's see what happens.